Good afternoon, everybody. I want to welcome you to the latest in our series of ENO Center for Transportation webinars. My name is Robert Puentes. I am the president and CEO of ENO. And as always, I hope that everybody is staying well and staying safe, um, you and your families. Today is the latest in our webinar series, The Road to Recovery. This series focuses on leadership lessons uh, and transportation strategies for our post-COVID future. You can tune in on Wednesdays to hear and interact with leaders across the transportation space who will share their firsthand knowledge and experiences on the road to recovery. And today I'm really happy that we have Ed Emmett with us. Uh, Ed is the former chief executive uh, called the judges down there of Harris County, Texas, home to Houston, it's the third largest county in the United States, over 4 million people. Uh, prior to his 12 year run as county executive, he was a member of the Texas House of Representatives. He chaired the TxDOT uh, Freight Advisory Committee uh, he served uh, on the Federal Interstate Commerce Commission and later the Surface Transportation Board. Among other things, he is now a professor at Rice, Rice University and affiliated with Rice's Kinder Institute for Urban Research. While Ed was with the county, he was also director of Harris County's Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. I guess that goes with the, with the job of being the judge. And that put him at the helm of the county in 2017 when Hurricane Harvey devastated the region. Along with 2005's Hurricane Katrina, it is the costliest uh, tropical cyclone on record, and I believe it was the wettest. It dumped over 40 inches of rainfall uh, in that region, it's un unimaginable amounts of water. And it's gonna share with us his perspectives and lessons on leading in a time of crisis and what lessons we can apply to the crisis that we're all leading, living through today. For those joining us live, you can submit questions anytime using the questions function on the webinar website. You don't have to wait until, uh, until we're done to, to submit questions. You can send them in at any time. So Ed, thank you so much for joining us. Let me kick it over to you. Well, thank you, Rob. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, as I understand what we're gonna try and do is I'm gonna talk for 15 or 20 minutes and then we'll throw it open to questions. Uh, I, I will put the caveat in that I do on most of these type talks. It's a presidential year. So in a way, I treat this like a presidential debate. You can ask any question you want, but I'm probably gonna answer the one I wanted you to ask. Uh, but if I do that to you, come back with a follow-up, I'll, I'll try and address it. Uh, you know, to say we are in uh, unusual times is a real uh, understatement. We have certain similar, seminal events in this country. Uh, clearly, COVID-19 is one of those. It's going to change the way we do things. Uh, and I'm going to compare it. This is a comparison that will strike some as being a little odd. I'm going to compare it to Hurricane Andrew back in 1992. Prior to Andrew, hurricanes were events, but they weren't events that really engaged the, the political world that much. But if you remember when Hurricane Andrew hit Florida, <clears throat> people became very concerned over what President George H. W. Bush did or didn't do and what the federal government did or didn't do. Uh, and ever since Hurricane Andrew then, government officials have taken more of a responsibility role uh, in, in hurricanes. You go to 9-11-2001, that was a, clearly a seminal event uh, that changed the way everybody looks at security. All you have to do is uh, go to airports. Well, we used to go to airports before COVID. And you saw how that changed things. Well, the COVID-19 uh, crisis that we're going through right now is going to also change the way we do business. If you think back to polio or anything else, yeah, the government had a role, but it didn't direct our daily lives. I do, I'm, I'm of an age where I remember when President Gerald Ford and the swine flu, uh, came up and he he urged everybody to go get vaccinated. Turned out not to be a big issue. In fact, uh, that was seen as a failure on his part for trying to do too much. I don't think anybody would say trying to do too much in, in COVID-19 is a failure. <clears throat> I do wanna focus on transportation world, but that's kind of from whence I come, but some lessons are, are universal. Roles change. Uh, County judge in Texas is, as you said, the county executive is probably a better description. County judge and the county commissioners in all of the 254 counties 
make sure the county operates, builds roads, parks, runs the jails with the sheriff, that sort of thing. However, 9-11 changed that uh, because the Texas legislature said, well, there's got to be one person in charge uh, for disasters in each county. The one person elected countywide is the county judge. So that's how the county judge in Texas became the director of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. Ever since then, the role of the county judge, uh, even if they don't know it going into the office, they figure out pretty quickly uh, when disasters come our way, whether it's a hurricane or now COVID, or uh, could be a chemical fire, could be any number of things. But not only did the role of the county judge change, frankly, so did the role of the president of the United States. Uh, and so will the roles of company executives and even company employees, because everybody is going to be expected to prepare for an event, respond to the event, and then figure out how to recover after the event. <clears throat> so just a few lessons learned from past events. I was not county judge during Katrina, but we all saw it. And poor preparation. Uh, who can forget the image of all the school buses floating in the water when people in New Orleans were desperate to try and get out of town? Uh, so lesson learned there was make sure your assets are moved and, and are, are usable. Uh, Hurricane Rita, which by the way, came three weeks after Katrina, and I'll hasten to add, and this is not meant to be uh, mean-spirited in any way, City of Houston and Harris County did a very good thing. Uh, my predecessor, Judge Eccles, Mayor Bill White at the time, welcomed the people from New Orleans and, and put them in the Astrodome uh, following Katrina because they needed a place to come to. But in retrospect, you look at that and we moved them from one hurricane zone to another hurricane zone. So lesson learned was get out of a hurricane zone, go inland from then on. But then when Rita came three weeks after Katrina, fortunately it didn't hit Houston, it went to the east of us, uh, the evacuation turned out to be a nightmare. Everybody got on the road. And in fact, in a hurricane, the only people who are in danger of losing their lives are the people in the storm surge area everybody else needs to stay in place. So it was pounded into my head uh, as soon as I became county judge. You can't let the, the evacuation itself become a bigger disaster than the storm. And so my job was to make sure not only the people evacuated who needed to evacuate, but that everybody else stayed off the roads so that the evacuation could go smoothly. And when Hurricane Ike came along in 2008, the evacuation was fine, people actually listened. But the real lesson learned, if you think back to, to Hurricane Rita in 05, three weeks after New Orleans, was the fear. Uh, everybody had seen the scenes from New Orleans where people were stranded, people were on rooftops, people were, were dying in their homes. And so that fear. So that made it even more critical that information be given, that people know what is actually happening. Uh, because in Rita, they didn't get the, the clear information. And a, a transportation related thing that's a, a, a little bit to the side. Uh, the other thing we figured out was, you've got to make sure that there's fuel available along the evacuation routes. I know that sounds uh, fairly silly to even have to talk about it, but people had closed down their their gas stations and, and the, the stops along the way. So the fuel availability lesson was learned. Nothing could match Harvey though. When Harvey came to Harris County in Houston, it wasn't a hurricane. The hurricane had actually hit south of, of Houston, near Corpus Christi, near Rockport. And so all the state assets had gone there as they should. FEMA had headed there as they should. But as the storm came inland, was no longer a hurricane, it became a huge rainstorm. And when the meteorologists started saying as much as 50 inches of rain, there's no rain of that record in North American history. <clears throat> so 
it caught everybody, I won't say off guard, but it wasn't something that we had planned for. So as a result, um, the biggest lesson coming out of Harvey is to be flexible. Uh, for example, uh, we were going to rely, and I, if anybody's with the Red Cross, I hope this doesn't offend them, but we were supposed to rely on the Red Cross to set up shelters when we identified which shelters to use. You know, by the way, at any given time, we may have 200 or more possible shelters in Harris County, but you don't know which ones you're gonna to have to use. And in the case of Harvey, it was even worse because I never thought I'd say this, a hurricane's easy, you know the coastal area it's gonna hit. But in the case of Harvey, the rain fell all over the county. So which areas needed to uh, get into shelters, which ones didn't? So we identified, I think it was 36 shelter sites. And we went to the Red Cross and said, okay, here are the sites, we need you to stand them up and make them operable. Man looked at me and said, well, we can't do that. We don't have any drivers. Why don't you have drivers? Well, drivers are volunteers. Makes sense. They're stuck in their homes like everybody else. So we went, okay. So we went out and we found the drivers. Went back to him. He said, well, in fact, we don't have trucks. I said, okay, wait. Why don't you have trucks? Well, we moved, moved the trucks out so that they wouldn't get flooded, which made me want to ask the question, uh, who drove them? But I didn't the other thing you always know about a crisis, you don't want to worry about what's going wrong. You don't want to fight during the crisis. You want to solve the problem. And, and so don't, don't take the time to beat people up in the, in the middle of a crisis. So we got uh, UPS and a local uh, furniture store to get us some trucks. We eventually got those stood up. But what that meant was we had to be flexible. Then we had the situation where the county judge from San Jacinto County, which is two counties north of Harris, a small, very small county, uh, called and asked if we could get the state to send supplies there. Uh, there was no way to do that. I said, look, the state can't get to us because remember the state had gone down to Rockport. In between the time they got to Rockport, the rains came and all the highways into our area were flooded. So we were on our own. So how did we resolve that? Well, the woman who was in charge of logistics for Harris County Office of Emergency Management, uh, one of the Harris County trucks just took a wrong turn and ended up two counties north in San Jacinto. And was that part of our plan? No. Was it the right thing to do? Yes, uh, without question. And then the final uh, two things that, that we had to be flexible about, uh, there was no way for law enforcement and first responders to handle all the, the rescues. So I did something that you're really not supposed to do, and that is go to the public and say, will you help? And the reason you don't want to do that typically is uh, professionals versus amateurs. You know, you don't want a bunch of citizens out there who then themselves have to be rescued. But this was such a dire situation, we really had no choice. And the other reality is uh, people being people, uh, Texans like to take great pride in it, but I think it would have occurred anywhere else. They were going to go help their neighbors. So anybody who had boats were going to go out. So I, I went on television and said, if you have a boat, come help. And then we had to put together a whole program. And I will tell you that in this computer age, the program consisted of yellow sticky pads or actually multicolored sticky pads. Uh, saying where the boats were and where the assets could be deployed. And so we engaged the public in that way. And then the final change we had to make was we had to set up in about a day's time a shelter for up to 10,000 people. And it was supposed to be done by FEMA, but the FEMA trucks couldn't get here. So we called on a local nonprofit called Baker Ripley, which used to be called Neighborhood Centers. And they did it turned out to be the best shelter anybody had ever seen. Uh, but after the storm, the publication ProPublica actually criticized me and, and people in Harris County for not following our plan. Uh, to which my response was, well, hell, Harvey didn't follow our plan either. So the, the lesson from Harvey is be flexible. And particularly when it comes to notice so many of these things were tied to transportation. Uh, being able to, to move about. Now we come to COVID-19. Uh, 
it's too early to say what all the lessons are there. But I will say that managing the information is difficult. You can get two stories back to back that are diametrically opposed. Uh, do we really know who's at risk? It turns out that 50% of the fatalities in Europe were elderly and, and were mainly in long-term care facilities. So what should the policy be in the future if you know who's at risk? But overall, taking all those events into consideration, uh, here are the three things that I think are, are most important. And then I'm gonna share some random thoughts and, and, and go to the questions. Uh, three things, number one, give as much information as possible. Full information is, is better uh, than, than partial, because if you don't give full information, then somebody's gonna find out something you didn't say, and they're gonna question everything you did say. Second, uh, well in advance of any event, I don't care if it's a fire, a hurricane, or COVID-19, know who your leaders are and empower them to make decisions. Empower that person to send a truck to another county if that's what's needed. Uh, and, and don't try to micromanage once you're there. Uh, they'll take pride in their work and they'll do it well. And then third, be sure to communicate with all the people you need to communicate with. The example I'll give you uh, uh, during Hurricane Ike, uh, we have 34 cities in Harris County. The city of Houston is by far the largest, but we have all these others and many of them were along the coast or along the bay and they had evacuated. So trying to find the mayors and the emergency directors and the people from those cities, I didn't have their cell phone numbers. Uh, so after that, we put in place a person whose whole job was to make sure we could communicate with all those uh, smaller city mayors. In the case of a company, you need to know who are your customers? How can you reach them in the time of an emergency? Who are your key employees that you need to reach? Uh, make sure that you have that communication line open. So those are the three things, full information, empower individuals, and, and make sure you have a communication with whether it's your employees or your, uh, your customers. <clears throat> now some random thoughts specifically related to transportation uh, coming out of the COVID-19. Number one, the supply chain is gonna change, uh, whether it's sourcing is gonna come from different places. We already know that uh, Japan is uh, incentivizing companies to onshore uh, some of the things that had been made in China before. I think you're going to see more and more of that. And the International Transport Forum just came out with a, an assessment that said the year 2020, uh, freight ton kilometers are going to be down 37% uh, around the world. That's a huge difference. So anybody who thinks we're just going to go back to the supply chain the way it was, uh, they're kidding themselves. Secondly, uh, employee and customer behavior is going to change. You know, think back to 9-11 and how that's changed things. Well, COVID-19 is going to change also. Uh, there are people right now who this is going to be their defining moment and, and the health and safety of themselves, their family, and, and their employees are going to be critical. Uh, thirdly, I think environmental concerns are going to come to the fore. Uh, there's no question that skies are bluer right now. Uh, and people are going to say, well, you know what, maybe now is the time to really engage in a more environmental friendly way. And I think that's going to come uh, in, come out in many, many ways. For example, different fuels. I think the, the move to biofuels is going to be important. Clearly, there's going to be a move to uh, go to more electric vehicles. But all of those things are, are going to come into play, not Direct, well, it will be directly, but not entirely as a result of COVID-19, but certainly partially. Uh, fourth, transportation funding is going to be in trouble. Uh, while everybody wants to put people back to work, there are going to be other priorities. So how the funding for highways and rail and ports play out will be very interesting to see. It'll take a great effort on the part of all of us. But I think the one thing that will benefit is new technology. And new technology is going to benefit, if for no other reason, because of the recent space launch. People look at that and say, hmm, we really can do things a different way. 
So transportation funding. Fifth, we have to talk about COVID, but we also have to talk about the George Floyd uh, movement, I'll call it. There are going to be societal changes. Uh, the way people are treated, uh, employment patterns, all, all of that uh, is, is going to be different when we come out of this. Six, assume everything you do and say will be public. Uh, let's face it, everybody today has a camera. All you have to do is watch the news, if you don't believe it. Twitter, Facebook, all of the, uh, the platforms that are out there. Uh, I, I'm amazed that people keep saying really dumb things and then they have to not only apologize, but in many cases they have to resign. And so uh, a very dear friend of mine loves to say, if you're explaining, you're losing. Don't do anything in your business that you're going to have to be constantly be explaining, because if you are, you're losing. And finally, uh, realize that someone else is likely to set your agenda. Uh, look at what's going on right now. Probably nobody in the transportation world would be functioning the way they are, except that COVID-19 came along and it changed their world. And that happens all the time. Back to Hurricane Ike, 2008, that was a big deal, we thought. But the week after Hurricane Ike hit, Wall Street melted down, the economic collapse happened, and nobody cared about Hurricane Ike anymore. It, it was yesterday's story. And so what we're going to see, I think, in the future is a constantly changing. I wish I knew what they were going to be, but I don't. Uh, but things that are a national impact and are covered nationally are going to impact you locally. Uh, you know, here in Harris County, we keep talking about COVID-19, uh, and people keep saying New York, New York. Well, we're not New York. Uh, the way Harris County is built and the Southwest cities are built, uh, social distancing is more the norm uh, than it is in New York, where you ride subways and, and elevators all the time. So that's a fast run through on, on uh, what's gone on in the past and where we are with COVID. And I think I've taken up more than I should have but I'll be happy to take any questions you have with the one caveat uh, that I gave at the beginning. That was great. And thank you so much for, for sharing those lessons. I, um, I'm, I really like the way that you connected them at the end um, because what we're trying to do with this series is to illustrate for folks that there are lessons that <laughs> leaders like you can apply to what's going on today. And every crisis is, is different, clearly. What's going on today nationally is not exactly what happened with, with you and, and um, in Houston because of the hurricane. But I think the lessons, the things that you walked through um, were very, very helpful and very consistent. In fact, this is the, we've done these a, a few times now, these series, we've covered up lots of different uh, crises around the country, Great Recession, um, Hurricane Sandy, the SARS epidemic in New York, 9-11. And a couple of things you mentioned are consistent throughout. And I think that it's really important for folks to understand this, that you mentioned transparency and communication is two, two of the key lessons. And we have heard that honestly throughout every single one of these of these series. So if folks can take anything away, I think that that is that is really important. Make sure that you're being as transparent and open as possible with the folks um, who are uh, who are impacted by all this, and that you're communicating as much as you possibly can. Nobody's saying communicate less. Nobody's saying uh, hide the ball. But that that does seem very consistent. And I have a whole bunch of transportation questions, and a bunch are coming in now uh, on the on the website here. Uh, but let me ask you one, or let me just make really a point, I guess, about, about leadership. Um, a, a couple of things. I was going to ask you what the biggest leadership lessons were. And as you were talking, I took two or three away. And I really like these. That One is not to fight in the middle of a crisis. That hasn't come up yet, but I think that makes an, an awful lot of sense. When people are stressed, when people are, are doing things that are outside of the norm, um, they're, they're bound to make mistakes. And you, as a leader... Um, to make sure that you're that you're not dealing with that now, you're making sure that people are doing what they're doing. It's a really important one. Um, flexibility, clearly, I think is is very important. That makes that makes a lot of sense. It's there's not really a playbook, even though you have plans in place. There's not really a playbook for doing things. You got to remain flexible. And then something as I was prepping for all this about um, really kind of talking about your leadership during this crisis was about your calmness. Everybody talked about that. That how calm you remained as a leader. And projected that that um, that that sense of of of, of leadership. I mean that uh, you know, throughout, I think was really important. 
um, so I just want to mention those three. I don't have any comments on those, but we can get to questions if you want. But I think those are the three things that really stuck out to me. Well, yeah, let me, I'll, I'll make a very quick comment because those are things that are important just in your routine life. And I, I'll tell you where I learned the one about uh, not beating people up in the midst of a quote crisis. When I was at the National Industrial Transportation League, we had a big annual conference every year. And that, that was the big event for us. And something would always go wrong. And the joke was always to, to the staff, okay, we'll all get together and kill each other after it's over, but let's go solve the problem right now. And one of the problems, it, it sounds silly now, uh, we had misspelled the chairman of the league's name in the booklet that was going to be handed out. So we had to spend all night putting a little sticky over it with the right name. Uh, you look back on that, and that was not a, an earth-shaking thing, but golly, people were mad at having to stay up all night and do that. Uh, but you just do it and you roll with it. And uh, that that's really where I learned that lesson was just on that little simple daily thing. That's, that's a good lesson. I'm going to keep that in mind myself. Let me, let me ask a couple of questions here. They're, they're just general things that folks want to know about um, kind of mm -hmm. your experiences. One was about the, 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 the plans you had in place. So, so I'll just read part of this. Do you, did you and various organizations and agencies prepare contingency crisis resilient plans prior to the crisis? If so, who took the lead in all that? So it's obviously that you, you were in charge of the county. Houston's a big city within that. Who, who was the regional lead in executing those plans? Well, the way it works under Texas statute is the county judge is the director of Homeland, and, uh, Homeland Security and Emergency Management for the entire county, including the city of Houston. But two points to be made there. And I mean, first, uh, Harris County has perhaps I'm, I'm biased, but I think the best office of emergency management in the country. It's got professionals there. That's their job. And I, as the elected official, uh, just needed to make sure the right people were in those jobs and that they had the resources to do their job. So that when the crisis came, those were the people I relied upon. But the second piece is kind of interesting. The city of Houston uh, makes up about half of Harris County. But nationally, people know what a mayor is. They don't know what a county judge is. And so if, if I go on national television as the county judge or the current county judge goes on, people want to go, why is a judge doing this? But they know why a mayor's doing it. So Bill White was the mayor when I was county judge and Hurricane Ike came. And we made a conscious decision that the two of us would do our press conferences jointly. And we would alternate who went first. So nobody would say, well, this one's trying to take over from the other one. And even though technically it was the county judge's responsibility, the real the reality is people know the mayor, and it's it's important to work together. And by the same token, the um, so Harris County has its own transit system. I think still does, but Houston Metro, the the regional transit system is is different, right? It's not under the county auspices, so you have to coordinate not just with the other government entities, but with the big yeah, Harris County really doesn't have, they have a transit program where they fund a little bit uh, in the outlying areas, but uh, the Metro is is the, the regional transit authority and it's got appointees from the city and the county and the small cities. It's an independent agency, but absolutely we have to work with them. And so you're talking about preparation, uh, constant tabletop exercises, things like that, that involve all the law enforcement, all the first responders, Metro, Tom Lambert, who now runs uh, Metro here, was, was a great partner through all of this. And we all, we all had to sit down and plan together. And have those relationships, did that help solidify or strengthen relationships? Folks are asking about how you work with other, there's a bunch of different questions about working with re, other regional entities. And it's, I mean, it's not the same in Houston as in other places. It's relatively not frag unfragmented. It's a big county and, and, and the big city. But how has the regional um, approach changed since since Harvey? Oh, uh, I won't say it, it's changed much since Harvey. Uh, it was evolving all the way through Ike. Plus, we also had two other major storms before Harvey. We had a Memorial Day flood and a Tax Day flood. Uh, so we had gotten used to working together on floods. Problem with Harvey was it just went beyond anything that anybody had ever seen before. And one of our problems, this is one of those questions I wanted to answer, 
uh, national talking heads, we had some retired general say, oh, they should have evacuated before Harvey. Well, number one, we didn't get hit by a hurricane, so we wouldn't know who to evacuate. But more importantly, uh, to evacuate 6 million people from a region, we'd had to start a week before and the weather was clear and I'd had to go on, me and the mayor, this time Sylvester Turner, would have to tell all the businesses in Houston, we're gonna shut you down for a week and they would have laughed at us like we were crazy. Uh, so having to go put out that fire generated by somebody at the national media was, was a problem. Uh, but I just told my people, you keep working, you keep doing what you're supposed to do. And, and one of the great ironies of it, again, because the mayor is known, uh, Mayor Turner had to answer the question of why he didn't evacuate. And it wasn't his call to evacuate, but I was glad to have him answer that question anyway. And that would have been your call as a county, county executive. For the, for the entire county, absolutely. So it, it, uh, the, the evacuation question kind of relates to a couple of things here. The, uh, and I've seen, I, I saw some of your quotes before um, talking about the biggest challenge for Hurricane Harvey mm -hmm. relief efforts wasn't really the infrastructure transportation challenge. We can talk about that in a second. It was about um, you know, the, the people, Harvey, watching people struggle to, you know, to get back to their homes, lost their jobs, lost their lives, all that kind of stuff. But so understand that that's the most important thing. But what was like the most then significant transportation related challenge then? Was, was it around the, um, the evacuation? Was it around rescue efforts? You mentioned the um, putting the the, uh, the citizens to work with the with their own personal boats. How do you how do you describe the transportation specific challenges? Well, the the rescue efforts were certainly the first challenge. Uh, we had to get people out of harm's way, and uh, an interesting thing came out of that, as the constables, the sheriff, the fire department, everybody, they were just going as fast as they could, rescuing people taking them to dry land and, and leaving them. And it dawned on us a little while in, once we were trying to get people into shelters, uh, nobody was keeping up with where they put folks. So we went, uh, gee, do you remember where you took that household? Uh, and I'm saying it with a smile now, but it was deadly serious at the time. So the plan now, and I assume it's still the plan, is an RFID chip. Uh, every group you rescue, give them a, a chip of some kind and say, hang on to this, and this way we can track you and we'll come back and get you and make sure you get moved to a shelter. So it was the, the first move was difficult, but the second move in many cases was even more difficult. The broader transportation question, now, you know, the Federal Highway Administration uh, can produce maps that show where all the commercial traffic is in the country. And if you look at the day before Harvey and two days into Harvey, you see that this entire region shut down. Nothing moved. And that's uh, at the TxDOT Freight Advisory Committee. <clears throat> we've looked at that because from a national perspective, uh, I think we need to find some way to designate some routes that are going to stay operable regardless. Uh, and that's where the federal government really should come into every region and say, no matter what happens, we got to keep this road open, whether it's I-10 or I-45 or something, so that commercial traffic can move so that a, a local disaster like this won't severely impact the entire country. This relates to a question that just came in, too, that they were saying that every, every major freeway in every direction from downtown Houston was closed during the storm. And you encourage the Texas House Transportation Committee members to empower state transportation officials to flood proof some major routes so freight could keep flowing into and through the region. I guess this is what you're talking about now. So Correct. did that did that happen? Was there any kind of what was the what was the it outcome of all that? It has not happened yet. Uh, there is a big project going on right now where Texas Department of Transportation is talking about rebuilding Interstate 45. Uh, it's a little bit controversial at the moment because of uh, social equity questions that have come up. Uh, but no, the short answer is no, it hadn't happened yet. And a major, if we had another major rainstorm, those freeways would flood again. So what does that mean to flood proof a, a major road like that? I, I think you just have to, in, in places where you know it's going to flood, 
you have to elevate it uh, or you have to make sure that uh, the loop around town stays open. Doesn't have to be Interstate 10 through downtown, uh, but it's that it's the, it's the cross traffic that needs to be able to to move uh, because we we couldn't we couldn't get any relief supplies in at all. And I'm glad you mentioned that that piece and the and the freight piece. We were looking this up. Uh, the basically all the freight transportation had shut down too. Um, mm -hmm. All the the roadways were closed. The rail service was closed. The the regional shipping terminals and ports were closed. I really had tremendous impacts, and we saw a stat that said nearly 10% of U.S. trucking nationally was affected by the storm there in the region. So this really was something that was of national significance, even though it was you know, really devastating for for one region. So how? So let's, so sticking with the national piece, how did the federal government respond, or how helpful were they as you as you work with them? You saw that they had two emergency declarations: one to Increased fuel deliveries, as you mentioned, making sure that people had the fuel so that they could um, so they could evacuate if they needed to. And then one was to address the driver shortage. Were those the two big areas of federal involvement, other than money? I guess? Well, with with transportation, yes. But the, of course, the bigger area of federal involvement was with the, the funding to rebuild and, and recover afterwards. And to be candid, uh, that's run into a problem. Uh, the mayor of Houston and I had negotiated. For example, on individual households, direct allocation so that it wouldn't go through the state. We wouldn't have an extra bureaucracy. Uh, and for whatever reason, that money has not flowed and the state has taken it back. And so there are the people who, this is, I'm going to get in a bit of a political statement here. My, one of my fears is the people who were severely damaged in Harvey have not yet seen recovery money. And I'm afraid the COVID-19 is gonna just sort of wipe them out of people's memory and they're not gonna get any, any recovery. And that's unfortunate. That's what I meant earlier about the next thing comes along and you forget about the one that went before. And since you left me that opening, how many times have we seen a bridge collapse and the federal government say, we're going to go repair the infrastructure all over the country. And then it doesn't happen. It's got to happen. It's got to happen. What would an appropriate federal response look like from a transportation perspective? perspective to you? Uh, after something like Harvey, I, I think to come in and look at what the, for example, the Textile Freight Advisory Committee is, and how to make sure that the, the critical infrastructure needs are met. You mentioned the ports. Uh, as soon as possible, uh, have access to the port and have the ability to move freight out of the port of Houston uh, into the, because, you know, that freight doesn't all come to Houston. That's a, it's a national port. Uh, those are the kind of things that the federal government really needs to step up and do uh, and just, and do them quickly. And you mentioned the railroads not being able to, to function during Harvey. Uh, I'll give a shout out to Union Pacific. Uh, one of their major bridges was damaged and I don't have the exact timeline, but they had it back up and operating in almost no time. And if we could get other, if we get government agencies to work as efficiently as they did, uh, that, that would be very helpful. Then the other thing we need to look at is uh, what technology are we using? Are, are we are we moving things in and out of the port as efficiently as we as we should? Now, those are longer term questions, but they need to be answered. One of the one of the big headlines that came out of the um, the, the hurricane nationally was that I think it was a million million cars were were destroyed during the during the hurricane. Obviously, that impacts a lot of people's ability to get around, especially in a in a large low density region like like Houston. Did anything change in that way um, after her, the, uh, the hurricane, people realizing that they needed more options to get around, moving from more of a car oriented region to something that was more multimodal, give people more options, something like that? No, <laughs> short answer. Uh, it meant we sold a lot of cars, but I think, by the way, I think it was only about half a million cars, but it was still a lot of cars. And, and you could see uh, vacant land out 50 miles outside of Houston, just filled with cars. 
uh, that uh, had all been been sent out there for whatever their ultimate goal uh, end result was going to be. But no, it, it uh, we are beginning to realize though, and since you left me that opening, uh, the idea of building many more highways uh, is, is probably gone. I mean, number one, the funding is not going to be there. Uh, we're now at a stage where the interstate highway system needs to be rebuilt itself. So new highways aren't necessarily on the board. Uh, so I do think people are going to start looking more and more to other uh, transportation alternatives. And maybe it'll be traditional metro or maybe it'll be something based on an Uber Lyft model. And there are a couple of questions around transit. Um, uh, uh, but I guess I can summarize. I, I think one of the lessons from Harvey was that the, the most of the bus and the rail network, and this might be more of a Houston mm -hmm. Metro question, but r relatively unscathed, I think, as opposed to what we've seen in, in other disasters. You mentioned Katrina and the bus there. Um, is that less, is that because of the lessons, I think, from the previous storms? You had mentioned Rita, you had mentioned the two floods. It was literally every year before Harvey that you had to deal with something like this. Yeah, Met Metro was back up and operating fairly quickly. And, and again, to give Tom Lambert and his team credit, uh, they took their buses and put them up on the uh, HOV lanes that run in the middle of the freeways. So that was a very conscious decision. And I, I, I'm sure that they had made that decision well in advance. Like I said, we'd had two major floods before. And so, yeah, they saved themselves a lot of money and a lot of grief by doing that. And that was a classic, uh, I think, leadership example on the part of Tom Lambert. That's great. And flexibility, too, to your point of being of improvising and being flexible. I don't know if that was in the plan, but it sounds sound like a good idea. I think maybe learn, a lesson learned from other places. I think hurricanes or Superstorm Sandy, we saw that a lot of transit vehicles were left in low-lying areas and were completely devastated. So maybe that was lessons from other parts of the country too. Um, a couple, just two more questions as we were hitting the time here. Um, do you think all the work has been done or has been completed to protect Houston against extreme flooding? Absolutely not. Uh, the, the best estimate uh, before I left as county judge, uh, Harris County Flood Control District said it'd probably take $30 billion to really protect the area. I mean, we're on the Gulf Coast of Texas. We have to realize that. Uh, we passed a two and a half billion dollar bond uh, issue, uh, which they are spending and that's moving forward. But uh, it takes a while and no, we, we haven't. And unfortunately, we still have properties that were built in places they shouldn't have been built in the first place. And those are always gonna be uh, susceptible to flooding. Then let me end with, with this one too. This is a, a question trying to tie all this together. Any thoughts on how the COVID pandemic and the community sediment um, will affect the, the, the your region's ability to recover or to prepare for hurricane season? Given that we're social distancing, we're kind of spread apart. Is there, are there, is there anything practically um, that's going to affect us going into the season? I, I think the only real effect, and again, I go back to the fact that Harris County Office of Emergency Management no matter who the county judge is, the people are still there. They are uh, truly professional and they've already been talking about in the COVID environment, the change in shelters that we have to do, the social distancing, the way we do the rescues. I already mentioned uh, they're gonna be better at tracking who's rescued and where they're sent, those types of things. So no, I have, I have confidence that, that that office will do very well. Well, that, that's a positive note then. We'll end on that one. Uh, I want to thank you very much for, for taking the time to, to share these lessons with us. I want to thank everybody for your participation. Uh, as I mentioned, this Road to Recovery webinar series takes place every Wednesday at this time. Next Wednesday, we're going to take a look at what public transit might look like post-COVID with a bunch of different perspectives weighing in um, from around the country. Uh, you can check out our website for more information about all of our work and our webinars at enotrans.org. While you're there, you can check out Eno Transportation Weekly, a really invaluable source on all areas of transportation policy and practice. And again, many, many thanks to you, Ed. Um, it's so good to see you again. Thank you for taking the time to join us. My pleasure. Thanks for your great work. And, and to all of you, thank you very much. Stay safe, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Okay.